Welcome back to the Hank Strange Situation, Lifestyles of the Locked and Loaded. Make sure to check out HankStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Hank Strange. I'm joined by my friend Sam Andrews of Andrews Custom Leather. Sam, good to see you again. Good I know, to I know. see you, Listen, as always. Yeah, you know, people aren't supposed to shake hands, but I cannot see. Just one time, Sam. <laughs> That's all you get. <laughs> you know what? Before we get into the video... Um, I wanted to talk about the fact that the first How It's Made video that we did, which right. I think was on the saddle. On the saddle so, style, yes. Million views. Who would have believed it? Absolutely. And then I think altogether with all the videos that we have, we're probably approaching 2 million. So Amazing. that's pretty awesome. Yeah, congratulations to you. Absolutely. Thanks to all the folks out there that watch this stuff over and over again, I'm assuming. I can't I mean, believe how much patience people <laughs> have to sit through my long-windedness. <laughs> Absolutely. They, they, love, they love it. So thank you for that, taking that's the time. Pleasure. I think it's been a great partnership with me and you Absolutely. over the years. You support what we do on the channel, even the stuff that, that has nothing to do with leather holsters. So we appreciate that. It all works out. Absolutely. So... We're getting into something. Um, what's what are these style of holsters that we're doing? Uh, how it's made of today? These are the spring break shoulder holsters. Spring break. Okay. Most people will remember them from the very classic Dirty Harry movie, oh, okay. where Clint grabbed his big model twenty nine and just cracked it right out the front. There's a spring closure on this style of holster holding the weapon in, so you don't have to make an exaggerated arm movement. To draw a large weapon. So there's up. not. Is there a thing that you have to click off, or anything like that? Well, you just drag some, it out, or some of them will have a safety oh, okay. strap, mm -hmm. and that's removable. It snaps on either side. Okay. Others just use the spring by themselves, and oh. that's really up to the customer. Okay. People who want to use them in the field for hunting will often add a strap. Add a little strap. Sure. Yeah, and then when they're about, when they know they're about to use it, they probably take that off. And exactly. Then, if they're I stalking, see. they can just. Right. Pop it off each side. Oh wow! Put okay. it in a pocket. Cool. Good to go. Are these very popular? These are not as popular as our concealed style, the Monarch shoulder mm -hmm. holsters. These are more specialized, mm -hmm. more for handgun hunting or people who want to carry a large weapon yeah. for self-defense. Yeah. Any of those dirty hairy dudes out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. So uh, before we get into it here, any special things you want folks to know about how we're going to do the video today? What we're laying out. We're going to take you from the beginning with the pattern and cutting out the materials through all the assembly steps to the final finished product, how it all works. And there are a lot of steps in these, so mm -hmm. you may have to be a bit patient with us. Absolutely. All right, let's get into it. Absolutely. To begin with, on these, like any other holster we make, you need a pattern. These have been developed over lots of trial and error, many years. This pattern will give me both the outside of the holster and also I've marked where I need my inner channel pieces that will hold the actual spring when we insert that. Also, stitching patterns, it's all in one. So, using my spare hand to hold it down, just trace it out. I like to use at least about a 10 ounce leather on these holsters because they need the body to contain the spring and the tension it puts on the leather. Lighter leather could buckle and twist. Okay, so this is 10 ounce. What's, what do you usually use? It depends on the holster itself. Mm -hmm. a, a Monarch, the holster is made out of about an eight ounce leather. Uh, about a seven ounce on a McDaniel. It all refers to the thickness. Mm -hmm. I don't know where the tradition started, but in leather speak, an ounce means a 64th of an inch. I don't know who started calling it ounces, but now we do. Okay. And just for anyone wondering about patterns, just because I know that comes up sometimes. Right. Um, you obviously don't share your patterns, but we did do a video on how people can make right. patterns. My right? patterns are proprietary, and we did a video showing how to measure things and make patterns so you can create your own. What I'm doing now by poking on the marks 
is providing my stitching lines, which I'll use a ruler to connect the dots of. And that will give me everywhere I need to sew. Next, everything needs to be cut out. As always, I use a scrap of le uh, leather, <laughs> under the leather, a scrap of carpet. That way my knife blade can go through in one pass and not hit the table. Now, what's this glove doing? It's actually just a brace for the palm because I push with the palm against the end of the tool. Oh, okay. And after 44 years of doing leather work, there are nerve ganglions in your hand you don't want to keep under pressure. Mm -hmm. So by having this stiffened piece of leather, it's like a sailmaker's palm. They used to use these to push heavy needles through the canvas sails. Oh, okay. It spreads out the pressure and this way you don't get odd tinglings happening in your hand. Yeah. Saves you from uh, some repetitive injuries. Exactly. Oh, the leather's getting a little grabby here, so I need to hold up and use the tip of the knife more so I don't over control and cut where I don't want to cut. In the same piece of leather you'll have tighter and looser grain and you could be cutting along all well and happy and hit one of those hard spots. It's like a little leather landmine. It can make you go off and cut places you really don't want to cut. I like to use a corner of a table when I'm cutting out these larger pieces because that way you can swing around and get it from different angles. Because you always want to be cutting away from yourself. It makes it really difficult if you try to take corners and break your wrist and twist around, you lose the control. So it's better to move the work and always be cutting away. I could really see the difference, in, like you said, in the, in the um, thickness of the leather and how you have to work this. Well, you see, it's the same thickness, mm -hmm. but down toward this end it was harder mm -hmm. than up around this end, so it just took more force to cut. Mm -hmm. You don't want to rush it. Yeah. Now, I also cut out this relief. This is where the rear sights of an adjustable sight revolver will sit when the weapon is in the holster so they're not rubbing against the lining with sharp corners or catching when you try to withdraw the weapon. And we also need the belt strap. Unlike our Monarch holsters, which are free floating, the spring brake has to be kept tacked down to the belt. This flap on the back goes up underneath the belt and snaps to the back of the holster because when you're pulling out against the tension of the spring, if the holster bottom is not anchored down, it's going to swing up and clamp to the end of your barrel and you'll have a heck of a struggle getting the weapon out. 
So these need to be kept tacked down through the belt. Next we need to cut out the inner channels that hold the spring itself. That's what the other dots on my pattern are for. So I trace the outer edge and I start pressing on these for my connect the dots. And this will complete the pattern that needs to be cut out. You could create separate patterns for these. I just find it easier to use it all on the same piece. That way they don't get lost and separated. Cutting is accomplished in the same way, but since this is about a 4 or 5 ounce leather, it is certainly easier than the heavy main body of the holster. This gives us our main components that we need for the spring brake, the interior supports, the belt flap, and the main body. I now draw on my stitching lines connecting those dots that I placed on there earlier. Just a quick thing. So mm -hmm. obviously we're working here while the whole crisis is going on. You're part of a, you're an essential business. I feel essential. Officially. Um, are you getting a lot of uh, orders for holsters? We have been extraordinarily busy in normal times. Now that everybody is sitting at home and watching things on YouTube, we are getting truly buried. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a good thing and a bad thing, I guess. Well, it's nice to have a lot of work. Absolutely. Okay, so this is, we've seen some of this process before with these punches. Uh, these are just specific to this rig, right? Right. We need holes for the hardware, such as snaps. Then this is where the anchor is going to be the loop that holds the lower back strap. Mm -hmm. And then we need a slot down here for the belt flap to fit into. Before we apply any interior linings, we have to set in the hardware. The top there this is going to be the belt lockdown snap. I use a T-nut so I can screw the snap in place. That makes it replaceable if it gets damaged or weak down the line.
I put a screw in it to center it up in the hole. That way it goes down the middle and I don't damage the end threads. Okay. And for the regular snaps where the safety strap is going to attach, we just use regular post and stud. I learned the hard way not to just smack it with a huge blow because often that will make it collapse to one side or the other. Tapping it down while keeping the setting tool really straight gives you an even spread and it just gives a nice rolled score and I don't end up having to drill it out and do it again. Okay. test as I see if it will still spin. If it's not spinning, it's well set. Now before I can insert the pieces that go in here, I have to finish these edges because once it's in, you won't be able to get at it. So, being an unlined piece, I always groove the edge. And then we give it a bevel fore and aft to get rid of that square edge. These were the best bevelers I ever used, and sadly Tandy has stopped making them. So we are trying to make these last as long as we can, sharpening them endlessly, but eventually we'll have to adapt to something else. It's a shame. Good tools make a great deal of difference in the work. Mm -hmm. And now I have to slick this before I can insert it, get the edges all laid down with a hard round edge. So first to the power slicker. And now for something completely different. Now we'll be slicking on the machine. You can do all this by hand, but to get the initial 80% of the slick on the machine saves a lot of time and effort. It's just an aluminum arbor with different sized slots that we've cut in and polished out. It really makes the edging go more quickly. You have to make sure it's good and wet you don't get leather bits adhering. The machine will do 70-80% of the smoothing, but it really pays to finish it off by hand. Either with a slicking wheel or a scrap of denim. Get that really hard, round, glassy edge on it. And since the slicking tends to mushroom the edge a bit, always press it down flat. The hard edge of the slicking wheel works well for that. Now we have the really slick hard edge. This is going to go in this slot, be our tie down for the belt. But before that, it's time to sign the work. So. This makes a good place to put our sign, Andrew Stamp. Make sure it's right side up. The dead blow hammer works beautifully for this because it doesn't bounce and create multiple images. Now's the time to position the channels for the spring itself inside, I look at the stitching guideline that I've placed on the outside of the holster, make sure my edge is above it so I'm not stitching off the edge of the leather, and trace it on the inside, the front piece and the rear piece, so we'll know where to apply the glue. Before I can put these on, 
have to include the anchor for the lower back strap. We set that tab through there. Make sure you can swing the D-ring. And also make sure that the leather will come up to the gluing line so that when we do stitch it, stitches will run across there and secure it in place. The same goes for the belt tie down. That's a very snug fit in this slot. Now that we have these tabs inserted, I just give them a little glue to tack them down in place. Don't want it shifting when you're doing the stitching. While that's drying, I'll apply the glue that goes on the front one. In this case, you only want to get glue along the edge. The center has to be kept dry because that's creating the channel that the spring is going to slide up inside when we insert it. So actually making a tunnel. When you're applying the spring tunnel pieces, it's very important to get them even up with the edge. I do that by just holding it off with this hand and running a finger along as I place it in contact, just to make sure I'm not underlap or overlap on the edge. While this glue is still a little too wet to put together, I'm going to skive down a bit on the foot of the belt loop here just to get rid of that really square bottom and make everything else fit more evenly. Just the same as the front to apply the spring channel piece here. I run my thumb down the edge to make sure we're coming up even. It's going to overlap a bit on the foot of the belt flap, which is why it's got to be installed before you put on these pieces. Now, as this is a revolver holster, we create a pocket for the cylinder so it will sit on the cylinder edge. And to do that, place a couple of strips of leather on the inside to create that shelf. So I look on this side, get my pen lined up with the mark I made, and that gives me the middle part of where the stitch is going to go, so that I'll be stitching through the center of these, <laughs> not coming off the edge. So they face each other on each side create that shelf for my cylinder, dab the glue on each, and since all of this is going to be covered by the lining, you don't have to be too, too careful about if you get a little too much glue on, it's all going to get covered up. I 
I fair the edges of these a little bit. Whoops. So it isn't creating a sharp edge underneath the suede. So they just round off on the edges. Now, being that this is going to bend over and hold the spring, we have to make sure that the two pieces can't collapse. So we use a metal reinforcement, both top and bottom, that will go in between the leather and the lining to keep it rigid so it can't collapse one edge over the other. Now, I find that just galvanized roof flashing, which you can pick up from Home Depot or hardware, works absolutely wonderfully for this. Easy to cut, easy to shape, and does the job perfectly. First order business, get a straight edge on it. This is actually much bigger than I'm going to need, but it allows me to move it up and down as it's slightly truncated and get it fit. There we go. Need to take off a little more on that edge. This is mostly just done by eye, as this is so easy to cut. There we go. You want to fill in the space between the cylinder shelves and the top of the belt loop because stitching is going to run across there and you don't want metal where you're going to be stitching. That can bring things to a very abrupt and unpleasant halt. And then across here, we just need a wide piece round off the ends and I do take the corners off these just so nothing pointy is left inside that perhaps over years could wear through leather I don't really think it can, but why take the chance? Now I'm going to take these over to my grinder and just fair off the edges so there's nothing rough left over from the cutting. Before I put this piece in, the part that goes down, I put a couple little relief cuts in it because this edge needs to be able to flex and curl and that just seems to create less of a strain on the leather that it's going on to.
while these are drying I'll get the lining cut so we have that ready to go. Most of these I like to use about a four or five ounce suede. That gives you a very good and tough interior that won't wear through with years of pulling the weapon out between the spring-loaded edges and protects the finish from undue wear. Flip it to the good side. Getting myself turned around. When you're placing the metal reinforcement, you always want to look and make sure that you've got plenty of clearance for your stitching. Again, contacting metal with your sewing machine probably voids the warranty and isn't going to help anything in your project. There. Channels in for the springs. Shelf for the cylinder, the reinforcement pieces, the belt loop, all ready now to apply the lining. I actually neglected one minor detail. At the top of the spring covers here, before I glue in the lining, I like to fair off the edge because you don't want a hard square edge underneath for things to catch on. So if you transition that top, it's going to work a lot better throughout years of service. There, these are fared down. Time to apply our liner. Oh, a note on gluing. I like to glue the edges from the inside outwards because what you don't want is to come into the leather. That edge will scrape glue off your brush. It'll then get onto the edge and make somewhat of a mess when you're trying to do the edge slicking. So inside out works very well and the glue all goes where it's supposed to go. Oh yeah, I could smell that. We don't have smell-o-vision, but that stuff is... Oh, it's potent. pungent. Yeah. You want to use barge cement in really well-ventilated areas. Mm -hmm. It's full of chemicals which are very bad for you. So usually we have fans on, big doors rolled up, lots mm -hmm. of ventilation. So what are you thinking here when you're applying it to, um, this is your liner that you're applying it to? Right, you want to get a good even coat all over it, no dry spots, because contact cement only sticks to contact cement. So if you leave a dry spot, it's not going to adhere well. And take it right up to the edge, that way when you're placing your leather on, you've got more margin for error. You don't want to get it onto a dry edge. Now we let that sit for a moment before we put them together. 
it has to get a little bit tacky if you're going to get a really good bond on it. Now that the lining has had a chance to dry and adhere well, I need to trim it off before I get around the side. I have to trim out here for the sight relief. It's a bit tricky. You want to hold it up off the table and keep a finger behind, but try to keep the finger and the knife separate. For the trimming, I just slide the knife along the edge of the leather. You just be careful of your angle because you don't want to cut into the leather and create a divot. I keep the edge of the leather close to the table. You don't want it out here where it's going to wiggle up and down a lot. You lose the control. By having it supported by the table, you can slice through the suede and keep things all on an even keel. The lead just helps me like a third hand so it's not trying to slide off. lined and almost ready for stitching. In order to true up the edges because we have multiple layers we want to take it first to the belt sander and get everything flat and even. Now we need to put our grooves in for the stitching to follow. With the groover for control it's best to pull it straight toward you so much better to move the work than to try and turn your hand. This not only creates a guide in which to stitch but it also allows the stitching itself to set down in the groove so it's not standing proud of the leather to get worn off. Presser foot height because our thickness of the leather is changing there.
Okay, I see why uh, that's an intimidating thing, the, <laughs> the sewing machine. It's really like a dance that you have to be experienced to do. Well, you, on this one, it's more difficult than most because you've got so many multiple layers. You're going from thick to thin and back again. Mm -hmm. And you have to make sure that the presser foot is not squeezing too tightly to let it advance because the needle is actually pulling it through. It comes up, moves over, and goes down. Mm -hmm. And so if the presser foot's too tight, it won't allow the needle to drag the leather through. Mm -hmm. So you just learn by doing where it needs help. And it's, uh, it's a lot like playing concert piano. Mm -hmm. For trimming the threads, I found a scalpel is an excellent tool. You can also use the pointy X-Acto knife, but these just really cut beautifully. And the trick is to get the point down in the hole with the thread, so we're cutting it off rather below flush and not leaving any little tufts of thread sticking out. On the back, you can just take it off flush. It's all going to be interior and less to worry about appearances, just so long as nothing is really sticking out to catch. Now we've got it stitched, edges sanded flat. Next item, we're beveling off the square edge to round it. Now, these Osborne bevelers are not quite as easy to use as these, but they're still being made, whereas this has been discontinued, so it's a very good beveler for cutting. You want to be careful on the transitions where you have two layers of leather going down to one layer, because you can overcut if you're not careful. Now right here, this makes the edge kind of like a hobby horse, so I'll frequently take it to the edge of the table so it's all laying flat and I have the bumpy side off there. That makes keeping even transitions a lot easier. Because this is really thick, I bevel it at two angles, one to get the major part of it, and then I flatten out my angle again just to get the little ridge that was left on top. Now it's time to slick those edges that have been beveled. You want to get that really hard, smooth polish on them. So give it a good wetting down. And since there's so much edge on this, I do it in sections.
it's ready for the hand slicking. Now that we have the machine slicking done, that's done 80% of laying the edge down. But to get that really mirrored, hard, slick finish, got to do it by hand. I just used the wooden handle of a tool. Makes a great slicker. I come at it from three different angles. So this way, flat, and this way to get the rounding on it. And I try to slick in largely one direction because I'll be putting the edge coat on in the finishing by pulling a dauber this way. So if you bring all your fibers in this direction when you're doing the slicking, everything lays down and is smooth in that direction instead of scrubbing back and forth, which can with looser leather defeat your purpose. Now as we slick, we're mushrooming up the edges of the leather, so it's this nice hard piece of very smooth plastic, or you could use wood, makes a good tool to flatten it back down with. Makes all the transitions sort of flow into one another. Oh, one useful trick. If you're using leather, which is somewhat grainy on the hairy edge, keeps on standing up, take a rag of coarse cloth, denim or canvas works really well, bunch up the cloth and pull the cloth in a polishing motion in one direction. And that also works well to lay it down. Next, to get the spring ready for inserting, we have to open up the channels that we've created the tunnels for it to go into, which is covered by the lining. So, taking a razor knife and find the bottom edge of where the leather ends, and with just the tip, slice in at an extremely flat angle. So we're slicing just the suede lining and opening up for the spring end to go up inside. In order for the spring to be able to fit without a monstrous fight, you have to open it up. I just take a heavy gauge piece of wire, bent into this T-shape, sharpened on this end, slide it up in there with a side-to-side -side twisting motion. And it's a bit of a struggle sometimes, but you get it all the way up there. It opens up the passage for the spring, and that's a lot less hammering and cursing you'll need to do when it's time to insert it. All the way up to the top. Then, rub one of the wooden tool handles along there to help shape the leather around that wire. We're going to do this on both sides and open it up for easy spring installation. Now that we've got the spring channels molded out, it's time to bend this around into its final shape. I've gloved up because sweat on the hands can create indelible black stains on the unfinished leather. And I'd rather not get something to this point and ruin it. So this time we give it a good thorough wetting all over because the leather needs to be pliable, especially where it's bending around the metal reinforcements inside, otherwise it will crack. And at this point, if you bend it and it cracks, you are allowed to cry and use intemperate language. Perfectly understandable. I sort of gentle it into the bend bit by bit. You don't want to just crunch down on it because you can get splitting. And we do want to avoid splitting the leather at all costs. So just get it rolled around 
gently squeezing it down. Doesn't hurt to add more water, keep it pliable, keep it stretchy. Now it's in its final shape and ready for the spring to be inserted. But first, we'll need to make a spring. Here's where it gets interesting. Now, there is no source for the springs. The springs have to be made by you. It's not difficult, it's just frustrating at times. I use a basic form of spring wire that I get from Neotech Spring in California. I've been buying from them for 30 some years. They just do me a basic U-shape and from here you can create the spring in whatever length you need or different tensions depending on how large or small the holster will be. Place it in the clamp. You want enough of a foot on it that will fill the bottom of the holster. This will become apparent later when we install it to keep it from turning. So once you've got that depth, you just bend it over at 90 degrees to create an L shape. Once you've got the L shape in there, you need to flare the bottom of the spring and then cross the arms in opposition to create the tension when it's installed. So I use the edge of the vise coming up oh, probably an inch and a half from where I bent it and bend this inward. Then on the other side, try and bend about an equal amount in the opposite direction. So when you bring it together, it creates the flare so that the muzzle of the gun has room to come out when you draw, and the crossed springs are putting a lot of tension on each other here. Now, in doing that, it kind of bent this off from where I had it. So I just put it back in here, gently bend it back so everything is straight. Now to get the proper length on the spring, again bring the edges together, line it up, You need enough room at the bottom to sew it shut without the spring interfering. So I just walk my fingers up here. Until my thumb shows me about where I want to cut off the spring. So that the ends come about to the top of the cylinder. Basic bolt cutters do a great job. That put a little mark on each side so I know where to take it off. Now, since these are going to be slid up inside the pockets we created, they have to be rounded off. Right now they're very jagged and sharp and they would catch on the inside leather. So we're going to go to the grinder and just try to round these as much as we can. Everyone's going to yell at me because I forgot to put on my safety glasses. Consider me chasing. When they're together, they're flaring a little bit out of the top to allow the gun to slide in.
Now that we've got the spring made, it remains to get the spring inserted. This took a little trial and error to figure out. First, you've got to get the ends of the spring up into the little pockets we created and work it up as far as it'll go. Now, I know a lot of you at this point are saying, wait a minute, it's backwards. Well spotted. That has to be to get it in there, and then you turn it 90 degrees and start working it up. At some point, it's just not going to go. That is where we use the personal percussive device. And it will want to turn, just have to keep persuading it back where it needs to be. Now, once it's down below the edge of the leather, I can't really strike it with the hammer without really making a mess of this. So I just took a piece of pipe, and you can tell how long I've been using this piece of pipe. Hold that on the edges there, and use it to persuade our recalcitrant spring down far enough that we can actually get a welt in between the edges and sew it shut. This is the most tedious part of the installation. As right now, it's really gripping and really, really reluctant to move. Nearly there. And people wonder why these holsters cost a lot. Finally, down far enough, we can get a welt in there, sew this edge shut, and the foot of the spring coming back prevents it from turning again so that our holster doesn't collapse one side over the other. Now that we have it sunk into the proper length, we need to make a welt to fill in the space. Piece of leather about the same weight as we cut the holster out of about 10 ounce. Going in here. Okay. Need to make a little relief for the end of the spring. This is just sort of cut and paste, try until it sits where you want it. And I trace out the edge. Going to coat both sides liberally with glue. I will need to give that a minute to get tacky so we can hammer it together. Now that our glue's gotten tacky enough, we'll just insert our welt, bring the edges together, and once it's in place, persuade it. Use again this rubber dead blow hammer 
which doesn't mar up the leather. And all that remains is to sand the end and stitch it shut. In order to stitch this, I have to have it laying out sideways, and this door gets in the way, so we first stitch started. When you're running something this thick, it doesn't leave you a lot of room for your fingers. There we go. First stitch in. Now that we've got this stitched and the edge sanded flat, all that remains is to bevel off the bottom and slick it, and we're ready for the shaping. There we have all assembled our spring brake shoulder holster. We're going to shape it to the weapon by wetting the leather and putting the dummy gun in. However, these don't get boned the way other simpler holsters do. For one thing, it's filled with metal. Very hard to get an impression through that. Well, everything in this one evolves on the spring to hold the weapon, so we just want to make sure that the cylinder recesses are shaped and that the gun sits at the proper depth. Now to get it to shape, we need to wet the leather down again. I like to get an even coating of water on here. If I don't get an even coat on, you can have watermark stains. So by covering it completely, when you do the finish, you're going to have one completely even color. Take the weapon that's going to fit, place it all the way down in. I could feel the cylinder recess catch the gun as it came to that depth. So what I do with my thumbs is I just press in on the leather underneath the cylinder edge on both sides, just so that as it dries, it's going to keep that, that grip that holds the gun in place. This will now go out in the sun for a good day or two and get thoroughly dry before the color is applied. All right, guys, so um, Sam, the, the next step from what we just did there is you put out in the sun, right? Exactly, the holster has to dry for a day or two before we can put the finish on it. And with constraints of time, we don't have two days to stand around. And wait. Right, absolutely not. <laughs> what we would do, mm -hmm. the next step would be to apply edge coat, which is mm -hmm. the dark edge finish here. Mm -hmm. And then we can color them either with the oil finish, which is pretty well the favorite. Mm -hmm. Dyes like cordovan, this is a very dark ox blood. Black, which is black, mm -hmm. and then Harnesses, either black or brown, to go with. Mm -hmm. Once that color is on, attach the rigging, and you've got a complete to go. rig. So before we go over options, um, I guess it are one of the options here that you can have this carved? 
you like could carve a design one. into you it. You could okay. have stamping designs. Mm -hmm. Some people like initials and letters. Okay. That's just You've got some the options customer. there, right? Absolutely. Okay. And then what are the other options? Because I think I noticed. Did you say this? These were cylinders over here. Speed loaders. In this, speed loaders in right. this rig. Okay. Well, we can do them either as a single rig. This is a solo rig mm -hmm. where you're just going to be wearing the gun. Mm -hmm. And you've got elastic going around the other shoulder to... Is that what this is here? Okay. Hold the harness on. Oh, okay. And then we can also put them on the Monarch rig, same mm -hmm. double-sided rig as mm -hmm. our more famous holster. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to have an ammunition side and a weapon side. Okay. In this case, it's an automatic with magazines. This one is a revolver has speed loaders. Mm -hmm. This fellow also wanted his knife, knife on the back nice. of the loaders. Yeah. <laughs> so the, uh, I know you only do a few different knives, right? So what knife options can well, you get? Well, he actually there? sent me his knife. Oh, he sent his knife. So I you mean, standard, we do the Smith & Wesson dagger, the mini K-bar, and the Tanto. Okay. If it's something else, someone could send it in under as long certain as circumstances. It's, as long <laughs> as it's got a shape that we can use, it has mm -hmm. to have enough of a hand guard. Okay for something to get under and secured in place. Oh, okay. All right, there you go. So what other, typically, what guns do you see people using with this setup? For these type of holsters, you mostly see the larger guns, mm -hmm. long barrel revolvers, Desert Eagles, something at least a five inch barrel automatic. Okay. And some of them we make you know, up to you know, 10 inch barrels. Okay. It just depends on what to ask for. Oh, okay. Have you ever made any of these for movies? Not this model. Oh, okay. Oh. All right. And then typically, price-wise, I know you said this is more expensive because there's a lot there's more There's a work. lot of work in them. Yeah, a so simple solo at? rig will start around 300 in the shorter barrels, mm -hmm. and they go up as they become longer mm -hmm. or as you add more options to mm -hmm. them. All right. Awesome. So what be you know what would be the things that someone needs to know before they're ordering this? I know you've got lots of different things, so... They need to call you up. Call Do they need up. to look at something first? Uh, Once look at they've the... looked at the options available on the catalog at mm -hmm. andrewsleather.com, then call me up. We can discuss options. I can give you different ways it can be set up. You know, imagination is the limit. Right, absolutely. <laughs> okay, cool. Is there anything else we need to know? Uh, pretty well covers the spring yes. break holster. Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, my mind has been opened <laughs> to different things that we've seen here. Lots of creativity going into this, actually, with like metal inserts right. and how you make the spring and all that. Hopefully, you guys out there appreciate it. It actually took a little bit longer than other holsters. This to is get a time-consuming holster to make. Yeah, there's absolutely. no way to rush these. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So we're gonna call it a wrap on this one. We'll do some other videos here. Uh, you guys leave your comments. Let us know what you think about this. If you've got some questions for Sam, Sam does come in from time to time and check the channel here, answer questions. Um, I would ask everyone to smash that uh, thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell so you can be notified every time we go live. Absolutely. Well, every time we post a video. <laughs> every time we post a video. As well as check out HankStrange.com and where exactly do the folks need to go to in order to order or find out details? Well, they can call us. Directly at the shop, it's 904-679-4997. You can look at our catalog at andrewsleather.com, and you can see all the things we're making on the Hank Strange channel. Awesome. All right, let's fist bump out of here. All right, we're out. <laughs> Make sure to check out HankStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts.